You've seen artificial intelligence on the news recently. Translation programs that let us speak across language barriers, intelligent virtual assistants, automated medical diagnostics, a lot of things that were out of reach for decades are suddenly getting realized. I work in machine learning, what's sometimes called artificial intelligence. It's a great job. It's like a mix of statistics and philosophy. It's especially good right now that we're getting to deal with some of these hard problems. What made them so difficult for so long was that they require a program running on a machine to interface with the real world. And the real world is unbelievably complicated. Just navigating yourself here today truly is a wondrous feat. I think we're all owed a moment of quiet self-congratulations just for being here. <laughs> all right. A couple centuries ago, we learned that the chemical reactions taking place inside our bodies were the same as the ones we could make happen in the lab. This was a huge surprise to a lot of people. We had assumed whatever was going on in here would be way too complicated to ever be replicated. But once we saw that we could understand what was happening in our bodies with an external model, we made great advances in health and medicine. We have a similar opportunity today to take the lessons that we've learned from teaching programs how to think, to reason, behave intelligently, grow and learn, and apply them to ourselves so that we can learn and grow better. So, why is learning hard? How did we overcome it? And why do you need to get to know more people? Well, learning is hard for two main reasons. The first is what we call the curse of dimensionality. A dimension is just a piece of information you need to keep track of to describe a situation. We're used to thinking of three spatial dimensions, but in any real-world situation, there's hundreds, thousands of things you have to pay attention to. Just sitting there listening to me, you're tracking my words, my gestures, tone, inflection, the context. You're paying attention to if anything more interesting is happening that you need to suddenly shift your attention to, which, no. <laughs> you have track of a lot of pieces of information. And the problem is learning is harder the more dimensions there are, and it gets harder incredibly quickly. Imagine trying to hit a target blindfolded with one dimension of motion just back and forth, maybe a few hits and you'll get it. Two dimensions, the entire range of motion. It might take a few dozen shots to hit a small target. Now imagine the target is moving on a track around. You could be there all afternoon trying to figure out where to shoot and when. That's three dimensions. The real world, with its hundreds and thousands of dimensions, is too complicated to perfectly learn. And as it turns out, we don't perfectly learn reality. We make a number of simplifying assumptions, what are called biases. These help us operate in real time. They're very easy to see in action. Pictured here on the screen are two parallel lines of equal length. Add a couple Vs to the end, ta-da, they look like they're different lengths. This is an optical illusion. It works by playing on our visual biases. Your brain is always ready to think it's looking at something in 3D, because it usually is. Because of how angles work in 3D, it assumes the top line is farther away. And it knows that far away things are larger than they appear. You don't panic when your friend starts to walk away and look smaller. You do a quick resize. Your brain resizes the top line, and now it looks bigger. And this isn't a problem. It's much more important that you be able to quickly navigate in a 3D environment than that you be right about this one weird edge case optical illusion. This is a perfectly rational, a correct trade-off that your brain has made. But it is a trade-off. Getting better at 3D navigation makes you worse at seeing that. And this is the second reason learning is hard. There is no free lunch. This is a real theorem. I'm not going to get into the math of it but it says that getting better at a decision-making process inevitably entails, it requires you to get worse at another one. There is no universal improvement. This goes against a commonly held social theory that we have, a hope that we might have for ourselves, to be completely without bias. This is what we thought AI was going to be for a long time a sort of uh, completely objective intelligence, a, a decision tree that had mapped out the entire world. It wouldn't simplify anything. There would be no bias. When it came time to make a decision, it would just look up the right answer and do that. What we found is, not only is the real world way too complicated for anything like that to exist in finite space-time, it's even worse. It's impossible. 
So where do we go from here? Well, let's go back to the optical illusion. You saw the lines as being different sizes. Did you think they were? No. You knew what you saw, but you also had your memory of what they looked like before. You had the context of my talk. You overrode the visual information with your memory. Well, it's not like we always trust our memory. Imagine a court case in which an eyewitness swears they saw something, but then you see video evidence that the opposite was true. You would doubt the memory because memories can be fallible. They can be wrong. They can be spotty. What's happening is we're taking information from different sources, each with its own strengths, each with its own set of learned biases, and combining them to get a final answer, which is better than we would have gotten from any of the complete sources on their own. This is the idea at the core of a lot of modern AI work. The decision tree has become a forest of deciders. There might be a dozen programs working on a particularly hard problem, each with their own sets of biases, each contributing a piece to the final answer. Even in one large neural network, different parts of the network will explicitly have different biases. They feed their observations and suggestions into the network where they're combined, and a final answer is arrived at. This works on two levels. If we find that one decider is right almost all the time, very correct and expert, we learn to listen to it. But even if not, even if it's just a lot of guesswork, the result is having a lot of different kind of systems all guessing about something, averaging their results together, tends to be better than any individual guess. Incorrect biases tend to cancel each other out. Some systems will overestimate, some will underestimate. The average result is quick to get and very accurate. The takeaway from today is that this is also absolutely true with people. You'll never learn how to do everything perfectly. You'll never be objective. You won't even be able to discover all of your biases with self-reflection. They are how you think. The way around that, the way to literally get better at decisions, to grow in intelligence, is to use an incredible resource we all have available to us, other people. We've learned how to operate in our sphere of the world. This has given us a set of biases that lets us solve common problems that we encounter quickly and efficiently, more or less. But when there's a difficult problem, or one that involves an area of the world where our biases don't hold, our decision-making is compromised. It's bad. But other people live in different spheres of influence, different parts of the world. They've had different experiences and different biases. Asking them how they think, getting the answers to problems, and averaging them with their own tends to be more accurate than any one person. You might have heard of the wisdom of the crowds, the idea that asking a lot of people to guess something and averaging the results of their answers tends to be more accurate than any one guess. This is true. This is a form of bias canceling. But it only holds when not everyone has the same biases. There was this incredible experiment where a group of people attending a lecture took a quiz and then they listened to the long lecture, and then they took the exact same quiz again. And the average scores were worse the second time. See, the first time they took it, people answered in a variety of ways. There was a lot of bias canceling because people were coming to it from their own ways of thinking. Then they listened to the lecture, and people learned how that speaker thought. People started thinking more like him. They couldn't help it as they listened, and afterwards, a lot of the variety was gone from the answers. People answered more similarly to each other, more similarly to the speaker. The average score suffered. The wisdom of the crowds was lost. Now, this is a good argument for why we shouldn't all think the same way, but it also shows an incredible opportunity. We can learn to think a bit like other people, and in doing so, shed some of these biases that we've learned, take on someone else's. There's no reason to stop with one person. We can do this for lots of people. And if we get to know lots of people and how they think and can simulate how they think, use that in our decision making, you can get some of that wisdom of the crowds in yourself, more accurate answers. This is called dialectical bootstrapping. It's absolutely incredible. In another experiment where people were asked to either guess an answer five times or guess five times each time thinking how someone they knew would answer, Sure enough, when the results were averaged, the people that thought like the people they knew, the whole group of people, had more accurate answers overall. Now, for this to work, you do need to get to know people well enough to know how they would think, to simulate how they would answer. And it works best if you get to know people with different biases than yours. 
These are people who've lived in a different part of the world, not just geographically. They can be people of a different age, race, socioeconomic class, political affiliation, religion. They'll have different sets of biases. By getting to know them, learning how they think, being able to simulate the answers, you will get some of that wisdom of the crowd, some of that bias canceling in your own decision making. So, take some advice from a machine. Don't deny your biases. Learn to grow past them. Get to know how different people think. Capture the wisdom of the crowds. More brains are better. You will only grow wiser. <laughs>